praise the Lord. Our God is good. And all the time, we're living in a new normal, a very irregular period of our time as human beings. It is much the same vein that marriages and relationships are also encountering new situations. And that will require that indeed our new person, as the Apostle Paul spoke about, that if someone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old things have passed away, and behold, everything has become new. Amen. I want to thank Pastor and Mrs. Japan. Uh, you have double Japan. <laughs> Presiding Elder Japan, who happens to be a good friend of mine, and his wife, Mama Cindy, and the leadership of the marriage committee, Elder Kumiana's wife, who also happened to be very good friends. For close to three decades, I've known them. Um, that relationship still persists to today. My wife sends her greetings and warm regards to all of you. She would have really wished to be here. Uh, yesterday, we spent virtually five hours with um, Achimota couples at the Golden Tulip, uh, trying to build marriages and encourage them. They had done two sessions on Zoom and then in person as the final one yesterday to compensate for their annual retreat, which they would normally go to a hotel. And uh, this time, because of the COVID, they rather did this um, whole day's event. Marriages are suffering. All right, let's read from Matthew chapter 19 whilst they sort themselves out. Matthew 19, which is your key text. If I can get a good reader to read the modern English, I'll read the King James. And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came into the coast of Judea beyond the Jordan. And the great multitude followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife and for every cause? And he answered them and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them in the beginning made them male and female and said for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they twain shall become one flesh wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh therefore what therefore God had joined together let not man put asunder. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing in, of divorcement and put away her? And he said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives. But in the beginning, it was not so. The focus this morning is in the beginning, it was not so. Why was it not so? Because God had an intent. And in God's original plan, he looked at man in Genesis and he said, it's not good for a man to be alone. I will make for him a help suitable for him. And so God's original plan was to get for the man one who comes into his company and then they share that companionship. They share the fellowship. They grow together. Unfortunately, what we are seeing today is that instead of husbands and wives becoming one flesh, they are leaving us two. Isn't it a mystery that somebody who is not blood related with you can become one flesh? And for that to happen, God says, through Jesus Christ in this writing, he says that for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother. He didn't say a man shall abandon. 
The construction of the language is so important. There are so many couples I have encountered over the years, 30 years working with people. I have seen people who construe or misconstrue leave to mean abandon. But leave is detachment. It is not abandonment. So I detach so I can attach. So you leave so you can cleave. Can we say it together? Leave and cleave. Anytime an individual is unable to leave father and mother, they will struggle to cleave because cleave means simply chase after and not get tired. How many husbands and wives are not already tired after six months? I've sat with people who two months after wedding, they say they are tired. And when you do a diagnosis, you discover they say they have been dating for two, three, four years. So you endure dating and relationship for four years, but can survive two months of marriage. Why? Because love before marriage is different from love in marriage. Love before marriage is basically sentimental. It's very, very emotive. It drives you crazy. Things are doing me. Feelings near deep. <laughs> and in this generation of whoosh, us, when you add feelings to it, it becomes disaster. So the guy says, I can eat. Then the lady says, eat for me. That is feelings near deep. That's it. It's so... It's so attractive, it's so, it's so charming, it's so cool and cozy. And let me borrow from my friends from Greater Accra, the gamin. If the person who is in your life for relationship comes to pass in your neighborhood and a relative or a friend of yours sees her, they come to tell you, Ogbomo <laughs> Ebaho. And, and then you go like, where, in where, you, in where, you, where is she? Where is she? And the moment you see her, everything around you calms down. Love has the power to calm nerves. I'm talking about pure love. But it can also get you crazy. It can also make you blind to things you should see. And so people say love is blind. Uh, that is love before marriage. But love after the wedding is an eye-opener because it comes with revelation knowledge and requires you to be intentional and not become sentimental. There are too many people who want to marry and they think it's just butterflies in my tummy. It's just the chills. It's just the whoosh, ash. There are married people here, ask them, when was the last time they felt the oosh ash? I have a therapeutic exercise which we use chocolates, and I make couples eat the chocolate without touching it, and when their lips touch each other, they let the Holy Ghost lead them without restraint, in Jesus' name. Oh, praise God, hallelujah. And yesterday when I put the husbands and wives at Golden Tulip, and as they were eating the chocolate, you could see some of them were so uncomfortable. And then as they were going, I said, keep going, brother. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep enjoying it. And then as their lips touch each other, you could see some were struggling because they, they're just too Pentecostal. They're just too Pentecostal. Look, when it comes to marriage, marriage is by human beings, a man and a woman. They didn't say they are Pentecostals. It's a man and a woman. So you've got to come back into your full steam as a human being. A human being has strengths and has weaknesses. And so if you're going to go into marriage and survive in the marriage, you must understand, like Jesus saying, male and female from beginning. He didn't say male and male. He didn't say female and female. And so there's no controversy. One famous preacher said God didn't create Adam and Steve, but he created Adam and Eve. So there's no debate from our point of view, from our conversation, we've got no debate. Say there's no debate. 
Now, how many of you are worried about the state of marriages today? How many of you are worried? If you are worried about the state of marriages today, it concerns you. How many of you are worried about the situation in the home? Oh, well, this, um, we've gone past this. Well, this is something, let me just explain. I was in the Netherlands for a conference, and in my hotel, as I turned on the television, they were streaming this conversation. It was in February, and they were discussing something called the Divorce Hotel. A guy who is a marketer and a business guy had noticed that divorces were becoming too difficult, too combative, too cumbersome, and so he decided to buy properties and convert them to places where you have a quick fix divorce. So you check in, within two days, your divorce papers are ready. And in this hotel, they provided you all the aspects, real estate, social workers, religious leaders, I mean, people who will help you to divide your properties. At the point of dissolution of the marriage, you have all those individuals ready to serve you. And when I sat down and I watched the thing, I said, this is what we must do for everyone who is going into marriage. Get them the finance person to help them with finances. Help them with the business guy to help them to understand entrepreneurship. Get them the psychologist to understand how people think, behave, and live their lives. Get them, anybody who can assist them with a professional touch. It's all part of it. He's just playing his father's role when he was a little boy. I've known Eben since he was a student. <laughs> <laughs> he was then a person president in these days. I mean, if you're a parent, one of the things that really shocks you is when you see your child doing what you did. <laughs> and when you see that, you get angrier, isn't it? So you watch around. My father used to knock me and say, <laughs> And he would give me a knock on my head. We do that all the time. Parents punish their children severer when they see them show their own tendencies. Relax when you see children running around. It's better for them to run in church than run away from church. Praise God. I'd rather have that. I remember those days in Tama Pia, I'd be preaching, my daughter would just come and hold my leg. And everybody is worried, disconcerted. I said, look, let her hold her daddy's leg. It's great feeling, great support. Some people are praying, Lord, bring my daughter, my son to church. They have been fasting, going from one retreat to the other. So when your child is running in the church, it may feel discomforting. But let us praise God for their running in church. Amen. And so this guy is now multiplying this business around the world. I pray that you too will multiply a business that strengthens marriage. How do you enter marriage and not have something you expect? So Jesus says, for this reason, it means you enter marriage with a certain expectation. What is your reason for entering marriage? Some enter for children. Some enter for economic security. Some enter for status. Some enter because they are under pressure. Some enter because their time is running out. Some enter because they want to prove a point. Some enter to make a statement to somebody. Some enter to tell somebody to me too, I am good. For this reason, because I've seen that the reason that moves an individual to enter into marriage is critical. If you have the wrong reason for marriage, you enter in and you behave wrongly. Because motives show themselves in your manners. It's like what they say, belief is seen in behavior. If you want to see an individual's reason for entering marriage, check their motive. Because your heart will reveal your habits. And your habit will show what is in your heart. Some people say, oh, how can you see a person's heart? No, it is not your duty to look at a person's heart. God looks at the heart, but human beings look at habits. Busy yourself looking at habits. And let God look at the heart of the individual. And so you must have expectations. But what I have seen is that when your expectations enter into marriage or relationship, they start encountering what I call experiences. 
I remember one evening, please go to the slides. You see a couple on the screen, expectations meet experience. That's where I am, just so the congregation can follow. We were sleeping as husband and wife, so all I had was my wife was tapping me. Ato, 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 ato. You are exhaling into my nostrils. Oh! We went for marriage counseling for nine months, and I was never told your wife will ever tell you. And that was a shock. So my wife now had to turn herself, or I have to turn myself and sleep on one side. I wasn't used to it. I was a kind in my father's house. I sleep here, I wake up there. I move like a person in motion. Then I had another encounter. We were asleep. And then I had lifted my heavy leg onto my wife. And then I heard her tap me. Ato, ato, odo, nai, do, do, yato, miso. Brothers and sisters, this is no fun. I had to now reposition myself. When our older daughter, Jesua, was born, as a young girl, at age two, one day she cried, Daddy, Daddy, I want to be at your back. Two years. I had to wake up and put her behind me. And I was moving around the room, back and forth, back and forth. Back and forth. Now I thought she was ready to sleep. I was, I won't sleep. I was not told this in counseling. So each one of you, especially those young men and women who are now hoping to marry, I tell people, prepare for what a shock. Look, I can give microphones to married people and they'll tell you their own discovery of what a shock. Because there are some things you know before marriage, but there are some things you will discover. One time in the middle of the night, my wife was tapping me. Ato, ato. I said, oh, 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 oh. I said, Holy Ghost brother like me. What do you, what do you mean? I said, man, no, no. A brother, Holy Ghost preacher, elder of the church. How can I be snoring? How? She knew me from afar. Charismatic brother. Exciting brother. Brother who is cool. Those days I used to be very round. And the girls really like my roundness. Don't envy me in Jesus' name. For crying out loud. I mean, to look like this at age 51 is not a joke. Some of you are afraid to mention your name, your age, because you think that, oh, I'm a boy, age crowd, I'm a boy, small boy. My name is small boy, but keep going. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I pray that as you go and prepare for marriage, I mean, this is me. My wife says, I'm sorry. You too, you say me, I don't want to marry a man who snores. Now the brother you are planning to marry, you have never slept in the same room with him. So that first night, what if he snores? I don't like disturbance. I want to have serene, tranquil sleep. Not in marriage. Because some husbands, their snoring is first gear. Oh. Second gear. Oh. Third gear. Oh. Fourth gear. Oh. <laughs> And I tell you, it can be disturbing. So what I've seen is that there are three kinds of expectations people encounter. The first one is the people exceed their expectations. When you get into marriage, there is a possibility. Please go to the next slide. There's a possibility. Go, go, go. You get to expectations of, of you, you, you would notice that the people get into the situation and they had exceeded your expectation. Yeah. They have exceeded your expectations. There are people too who will meet your expectation. The expectation will be at par. There are some too who will go below your expectations. I was going to preach at Nokia. There's a church in, of Pentecost called Nokia. 
if you don't know North Carnation English Assembly Nokia <laughs> they had a retreat at Hebzibah and I was guest at the I was to talk to them about expectations. So when I was getting ready to dress, I had dressed in nice suit and tie because largely professional young couples. Then Pastor Hushi was the pastor there. So I told my wife, no, I think I'm talking about expectations. Let me change my dress. So I wore shorts and sneakers. Then a t-shirt. They are expecting deputy youth director of the Church of Pentecost to come and facilitate a subject. So before they realized, sometime, shorts, t-shirt, sneakers. Hey! So I stood in front of them and said, have I met your expectations? They go like, mm-mm. <laughs> because when we look at your name and the attributions and where you are coming from and what we know, you shouldn't come in shorts, you should come in suit or kaftan. Sometimes in marriage, People may exceed your expectations. Sometimes they will meet your expectations. Other times they will be below your expectations. It's a reality in marriage. That is why people say, happy ever after. When you finish your wedding, as you go, they say, happy ever after. I've sat with a lot of people who are unhappy. In marriage and they come to me and said I'm not happy and I said marriage does not produce happiness rather you bring your happiness I bring my happiness and our happiness creates an atmosphere of happiness but you come with unhappiness and I come with happiness look at the couple on the screen one says I am fed up the other say I am sad Every word turns into a silent war. And below the lady is writing, Somimuye. There are people in relationships and marriages who are crying. Hear my cry, O oh Lord. Attend to my prayers. Who told you there are no tears in marriage? In your office, don't you have to share tears sometimes? To achieve your corporate goals. So when Ecclesiastes says two is better than one, for they have a good reward for their labor, he tells you there is labor in love. And when you go to the labor world, it's between life and death. So anytime you love somebody, you must remember you have a sentence of death. If you don't believe it, then don't sing the song. Oh, do, hey, yo, oh, do, oh, do, oh, do, yo. It doesn't mean the person should kill you. You see, I'm here to find somebody who loves another and something in them doesn't die. Unless something dies in you, love cannot live. Some of us, arrogance must die. Your tribalism must die. Your quick temper must die. Your bad attitude must die. Something must die for love to be experienced and to be enjoyed. And the original reason God had is that you are supposed to be a help meet, not a hurt meet. Wasesu buafo and yesesu obrofo. You have people in marriages who are bent on hurting each other. Always making sure you are hurt. They feed on your pain. I call it profiting from pain. Why do you profit from pain? The individuals who grew up knowing that they cause infliction of pain on others and they smile. Hey, how can you smile when someone is hurting? In 2012, I had the privilege of going to Pordenone in Italy, and I met a, a couple, an elderly couple. I was hosted by Pastor Samoa. Do you have the image of the couple? Old one. This elderly couple were next door. I'd woken up, and then 
I bumped into the woman in her apron. And as she stood there, she got shaking because Kodaki, first time, you haven't seen him before. So she, she got apprehensive. So I quickly called Pastor Samuel. I said, Pastor Samuel, please come. I want to talk to the woman. So Pastor introduced me to her as, oh, our deputy director from Ghana visiting Italy for a few days. And so that's me. Then the woman started talking. She said, oh, the reason why she came out was to come and look after her husband. And I call him Papi. Papi had been sick for two weeks with flu. The woman is in the kitchen, cutting lettuce and salad, preparing for the two of them. They just live together as a couple. And then, this was a shocker. The woman said that in two weeks, Papa was going to be 90, no, 99 or so. And she... 100 years, yeah, Papa was going to be 100 years, I think. Yeah, he was going to be 100 years in two weeks. And she was going to be 97 in two months. And they are living together. 97 in two months and 100 years in two weeks. And the woman is cutting something in the kitchen. And the man comes to collect the cutaway and he's going to throw it into the bin which is outside. The woman knows that her husband is battling flu for two weeks, so she comes out to be sure that her husband is all right. In the beginning, it was not so. When a man married a woman, he treated her well. Some of you grew up in homes where your father turned your mother into a punching bag. Punch her, boom, boom, boom. In Chalaneke, Chalaneke, no man will blows, boy. And that is what you saw. And you want to take that into your marriage? In the name of Jesus, drop that hand. And some of you grew up in homes where your mother can look at your father from head to toe and dress him well, well. Are you in my class? I don't want any man to... Look, sister, listen. That's not marriage. In the beginning, it was not so. In the beginning, they were help meet. They were helping each other. Because they left father and mother, they cleaved together, and they worked hard to become one flesh. I always tell people, on this earth, there's no human being closer to me than my wife. I can't have one. You should never have one if you're married. My wife is my bosom friend. She's my chocho micho. Oh, come in, pa. Now, there are a few things I want to leave with you as I close. Skip the definition and go to the three questions that I asked my wife on our anniversary. Our anniversary is always in November. If you're a husband, you never forget your wedding anniversary. Women don't joke with that. Yes. On one of our anniversaries, I was in the office and then I sent those questions to my wife to give me a review. Because an unexamined life is not worth living, we are told. In that same vein, an unexamined marriage is a, a difficult chore. From time to time, you must review your marriages. Some of us have forgotten even the vows we gave to each other. You haven't even gone back after a wedding to look at the vows. You yourself stood in front of the congregation and told your wife or husband. On radio the other time, we discussed marital vows and who were shocked. People who had just been married three years can't remember the vows. The first question was this. What was I doing previously that I have either slacked or stopped? There are some things you are here, husband, wife, you have stopped doing them. 
You used to go out. You used to go and sit at the pub to buy no coffee. You have stopped. You used to hold your wife and cuddle her, smooch her, grind. You used to grind. Move to the left in the name of Jesus. Move to the right in the name of the Lord. You have stopped. Your wife was in the kitchen. You just go and stand behind twerking. She's twerking. Now when she's doing this, hey, the ultra, the ultra, the ultra. You see? Meanwhile, when you go to the office and those girls are going, they say, hey, you did body, oh, this body, your body be that. Hey, we need more there. You could stand behind your wife and slip your hands under the armpit. It is called armpit release. Oh, hallelujah. Somebody say an amen to that one. Some married woman is here. She cannot even remember the last time her own husband slipped his hands just to hold. This is breast care month. Every man here, you are the chief examiner of the breast. Oh, amen. Oh, oh I said Amen. Now, if you are not married, you have no business going to examine breasts here. In Jesus' name. <laughs> that would be an abomination. <laughs> you know, what are some of the things you used to do that you have stopped? Then the second question is, what is it that I'm doing presently that I must stop? Look, when you look at your life, there are some things you're doing you must stop. And what is it that I haven't done that I need to start immediately? Look, brothers and sisters, when you do this exercise you would find something. In Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, he says, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. As young ladies and gentlemen who are here, I want to submit to you, anytime you give your heart to somebody, you have actually given your life to them. Who has your heart? That is why it's important to first give your heart to Jesus. My wife knows I'm very crazy about Jesus. Because Matthew 22, 37 to 40, love the Lord your God with all your heart. Give God your heart. Because it is dangerous to give your heart to somebody whose heart is not in the hands of God. They are wicked. They will mistreat you. Somebody called me and said, eh, this American pastor who had killed his wife. Elder, this pastor... He had killed his wife. So is that for better, for worse? I said, no, no, no. This one is worse treatment. It's not the same as for better, for worse. For better, for worse, let me just explain to you young people who are discussing it on social media. It simply is, I take you right now to be my husband or wife. There may be worse situations after this decision. I have taken you that notwithstanding. In spite of that. So when the worst situations come, I am with you. He didn't say that I'm going to mistreat you worse. No. Nobody promises anybody to treat them worse. That is why insult has no place in love. Beating has no place in love. Kicking is not part of love. Screaming is not part of love. Love is tender. Love is gentle. Love is peaceable. When love exists, love lifts people up. So if you're a young person and you're here, and the love that you have for somebody has lowered your spirituality, is not love. They must rather lift you up. So what do we do from here? First and foremost, do not make a promise you cannot keep. Every one of us, go back and check. Have you made a promise you are not keeping? Young people, people are not able to keep their promises. That's the first thing. Secondly, you must build a beautiful friendship. If you want your marriages not to get to the place where he will come and say that because of your stubbornness, Moses allowed you to divorce your spouses, there's the need to be friends. Build a beautiful friendship. Friendship is so important. I've sat with couples who are not friends. <laughs> and they have an old school friend, some Padibi, some Sister B. And they listen to them more than their friends, their spouses. Number three, intensify intimacy. Find cozy moments to be romantic. 
I have a friend, when, he, when they were marrying, he promised his wife, I'll make you breakfast every morning in bed. And they've been married for the past 28 years, and this man has done that every day that he's in the house. That is what we call promise. I prayed a prayer the other day, Lord, if I don't know and I make a mistake and I go and hold the woman's breast, Lord, let my hand stay there. Until Evelyn comes, Lord, let not my hand drop. Yeah, I prayed that prayer over my own head. And I've said, God, if I go and have sex with another woman, Maninkim, you ready? Missing Maninkim. Unless my wife comes. So you see, some of you, you are not ready to stand for something. In your office, everybody is sleeping with somebody, even including the married people. Build an intensified intimacy. Number four, relive your dreams. Your dreams are important. A dream does not have an expiry date. Take a deep breath and dream again. As young men and young women who are not married, and for those of us who are married, let us build our marriages well. When you look at construction, look at these people. They are building. They want to build everything right. The day I went to Italy, they took me to a portion, and they, there was a twin tower, a huge building. I don't think we have the size in Ghana here. I discovered Ghana, our tallest building is uh, about 27 floors. You're talking about like 80 floors thereabout. And it's all glass. And there was not a single car parked in the area. So I asked the brother who took me, why is there nobody here? He said, Elder, they didn't build it to specifications. So the owners have rejected the building. And now they have hired a company from Australia who are on the high seas to come and pull down the structures. What a tragedy. Build your life right. The lady you want to marry, she says, Manoe Yachi Meko, and you are following her. Tin, 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 tin. Keep going. Keep going. When you go and the pastor blesses it, and she looks at you, and I was like, don't talk to yourself. Bema Jimmy for Bema, Bema Bell, Bassa, Bassani. Okay, catch your own yard, then you come and cry to pastor. Meanwhile, he told you, she told you, said, Manoe Yachi Meko. The guy told you, Mimi Kuku, yeah, Maku, Mibufua, and he said, Motobre. No, it's serious. What did the guy tell you? He told you, as for me, I have a thing for women, I have a weakness for women. And you went ahead and you married him. Now, what did you guess now, Boboso? Make your health a priority. Make your health a priority. Look, young men and young women, stop eating all those saturated stuff. Because you think you are young, so you can eat anything. No, your health and your death is in your kitchen. Watch what you eat. Marry somebody who will compliment you, not one who will compete with you. There are too many people who are competing. Look, the spoon and the fork, they don't compete. They will never compete. They complement each other. You use the fork for something, you use the spoon for other things. I pray that marry somebody that when you are working with them, you can see they complement you. They are not in competition. Only we try to cry and one yefe and then we go and a photo and yefe. You go and buy a car. She too. She want to buy the, a, a bigger one than that. What kind of competition is that? May God make you a compliment to somebody in Jesus' name. You must also celebrate your companionship. Look, if you don't get ready to celebrate and enjoy, celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. You should celebrate your marriage. Some people are creating the impression that I'm planting a warrior. Who told you? Who told you? And there are some young men who say, if you can get the milk for free, why do you buy the cow? In Jesus' name, I said in Jesus' name, I said in Jesus' name, not in Graceland. I said not in Graceland. And some of the girls today are always available. They are never out of coverage area. They can always be found. I pray to God that as you celebrate your companionship, you will cherish 
the covenant. In G Judges chapter 2 and verse 1, he says, I will never break my covenant with you. I will never break my covenant with you. God has promised that he will never break his covenant with us. My question to you this morning is this. In the beginning, it was about covenant relationships. And because it's about covenant relationships, they took themselves very seriously. How serious are you when you tell somebody, I love you? In the beginning, it was not so. But they were granted a divorcement certificate because they were stubborn. Their heart was hardened. This morning, as a young lady, how much of love do you have for Jesus? To love human beings and not love Jesus is tragic. You must first love Jesus and Jesus helps you to love others as yourself. Please bow down your heads wherever you are. May the Spirit of the Lord set you, set you deeply, locate your deepest needs. In the beginning it was not so. Why is it so today? In the beginning it was not so that a guy just be sleeping around with girls. It was not so. In the beginning it was not about disloyalty. It was about loyalty. In the beginning it was about fear for God, reverence for the name of the Lord. And they never used the name of the Lord in vain. In the beginning, it was not so. What is it that has come into your life which was not there in the beginning? Get rid of those things and let the Holy Spirit fill you with that which was in the beginning. For as it was in the beginning, so shall it be. Life without end. Our gracious God, we want to thank you this morning. We dedicate our lives as singles and as spouses to you. We call upon the heavens, O oh Lord, to witness that indeed we are your sons and daughters. In that vein, Lord, we yield to you asking for your help. Help us, lead us, Rebuke us, O oh Lord, where we need to be rebuked. And grant us the grace to be able to live as help meets suitable for one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord.